Okay, welcome back. We're here at South Beach Gospel Ministries. If you haven't yet, like and subscribe and comment. It helps the video's algorithm go to more people. Got a bunch of new subscribers uh, this week, so greetings to all you guys that are new. We're picking up where we left off last time. We finished Revelation chapter 17. We talked about the destruction of Mystery Babylon, and now we move into Revelation chapter 18, which is the destruction of Babylon the Great, the corporate and economic and political center of the kingdom of the Antichrist. So let's just briefly review. Last week we talked about how Revelation 17, it is agreed amongst many Bible scholars. Uh, J. Vernon McGee of Through the Bible Radio Network, uh, Dave Hunt in his great work, A Woman Rides the Beast. Alexander Hislop, as far back as the 1860s, wrote a book about the link between the modern Roman church system and the Mystery Babylon of Revelation chapter 17. They all agree, Dave Hunt, Alexander Hislop, Chuck Missler, uh, many other Bible scholars have agreed that the modern day Roman church system based in Rome is the Revelation chapter 17 Mystery Babylon apostate form of Christianity that the Antichrist uses to manipulate and consolidate his nefarious rule over the planet Earth. And we find out in Revelation chapter 18 that there is another entity. Now, Dave Hunt in his book suggests that Revelation 17 and 18 are both talking about the Roman Catholic Church system and the false religious form of Christianity that Antichrist will use to consolidate his reign. But our position here is the same as J. Vernon McGee, same as Chuck Missler, same as Alexander Hislop, that Revelation 18 is now talking about a different form of the Mystery Babylon system that goes from being an apostate form of goddess-based worship in an apostate form of Christianity in Revelation 17 and moves over to, in Revelation 18, a corporate, economic, and political governmental system. And this is how it might work. Okay, so we find out then what? That the church is on the earth to do what? Promote the gospel of Jesus Christ, get people saved. And then at some point in time, when God says there's enough time, enough Gentiles has come into the program of salvation, the rapture of the church will occur. Shortly after that, we find out from Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, that the Antichrist, who's already here but just not been revealed, will confirm a covenant with many, probably the nation of Israel, the United Nations, and all the international agencies for one week. But we know that from Daniel chapter 9, we're talking about a week of years, not a week of days, so seven years. So it'll be a seven year long covenant, which happens to be the 70th week of Daniel, as we found out in Daniel chapter 9, when God sent the angel Gabriel to give this whole prophetic picture of the last world empire, a seven year period of time. During that seven year period of time, we have a neat division of three and a half years plus three and a half years, divided right in the middle. And this is probably how it's going to work. Antichrist will begin to consolidate his nefarious reign over the earth after the rapture of the church, after the signing of the seven year peace treaty. And during that first three and a half years, he is using a religious hype man, a man who is referred to as both the beast and the false prophet in the book of Revelation. This person, it has been suggested by Alexander Hislop in the uh, 1860s, Dave Hunt in his book in the 1980s and 90s, A Woman Rides to the Beast, that this is probably the head of the Roman church system of today, the Pope based in Rome. And so you have the mystery Babylon system based upon the rituals of the Roman church. And what do we have in the Roman church? Purple and scarlet are the colors of that church. Dave Hunt and Alexander Hislop have pointed out to us, and we talked about that last week. For those of you that haven't seen it yet, go back and take a look at that and look at the links that I put in the comments below. Um, and we also have incense being one of the high cardinal uh, forms of liturgy of the Roman church system, burning incense. That's not something you find in a Baptist church, right? Or in a fundamental, fundamentalist evangelical church, or even in a Pentecostal church. You don't find the burning of incense purple and scarlet and gold inside these houses of worship, but you find that where? In the world's largest Christian denomination, the Roman Catholic Church, which has over a billion adherents. And so there has been an excellent point made, and I think it's conclusive and irrefutable, that that mystery Babylon apostate form of Christianity left on the earth 
after the rapture will be fronted and headed by the Roman church system and the head of the Roman church system, the Pope. So we find out then that God destroys that form of false worship about three and a half years into this seven year period of time. And this is why God puts it in the heart of the Antichrist to get rid of this goddess-based worship system. And so we see the Roman church system, and we talked about it last time, has a queen of heaven. And that person, they refer to as the Virgin Mary, but they give her the title, the queen of heaven. Where do we find in the New Testament Jesus telling us that we're supposed to worship a goddess entity called the Queen of Heaven. We don't, but in the Old Testament, we find out that there was a Queen of Heaven. And we're going to look at those scriptures today. And the brief time that we have, we're going to try to cover those things. But let's give you the general overview. Okay, that seven-year period of time, that 70th week of Daniel, that seven-year period of time, first three and a half years, Antichrist uses the harlot system, the false form of Christianity left on earth after the rapture. All these prosperity TV preachers who are so-called Christians, many of whom from time to time get exposed and you say, you know, people that aren't believers say, see, that's Christianity. That's why I don't want to have anything to do with it. And so Satan has used a false form of Christianity to promote his works since the fall of uh, Emperor Constantine in 325 AD, supposedly converted into Christianity and became the Pontifex Maximus, he called himself in Latin, which means the supreme bridge builder, building a bridge between what? Between pagan Rome, which had adopted their paganism from ancient Babylon of Nimrod, Semiramis, and the Tower of Babel, where this whole goddess worship system really began to take form as an insular and powerful form of counterfeit worship of God the Father. Now there's a mother goddess that is competing against that whole paradigm. And so we see that Rome had always adopted that from ancient Babylon. And then when Constantine, under supernatural delusion from probably Satan himself, supposedly became the bridge builder between ancient Rome and its paganism and the Roman church that had risen up because of the preaching of Paul, Paul had preached the gospel in Rome, even while in prison, people began getting converted. And so Caesar eventually had to do what? Kill Paul by cutting off his head. And that didn't stop Christianity from spreading and growing because when the pagans saw that there was a God who was willing to die for us, as opposed to their gods that required us to die for them, they flocked to it like a fish to water and took to it like a bird to the air. And so Christianity began to grow in the city of Rome. And after Paul was uh, martyred, Peter came along and did the same thing, followed up the teachings of Paul and the church in Rome be continued to grow. Peter eventually was put to death by Caesar on an upside down cross right outside the city of Rome, not far from where Paul was executed in the dungeon of the Mamertine prison outside the city of Rome. And so you had the two pillars of Christianity that Jesus raised up after uh, you know, his three-year earthly ministry, both of whom were assassinated in the city of Rome, which gives us a hint to why in Revelation 17 and 18, it talks about the blood of the saints and that this woman who rides the beast is drunk with the blood of the martyrs. The Roman church system that came out of the Roman empire, once it became pseudo-Christianized, became the scourge and the terror of the nations and kings came to Rome to bow down before the Pope because at that time, the Roman church system had a powerful army, had the power of eternal life or eternal death. And so even kings and their followers from different countries had to bow down and pay homage to that system. But the ones who couldn't were what? The real born again evangelical Christians like the Valdenses, the Huguenots in France, um, the Hussites, those people because of their relationship to the Lord and because of this book, the Bible, knew they couldn't bow the knee to an earthly Christ who the Pope, again, he took that title Pontifex Maximus, supreme bridge builder, it means in Latin, between pagan Rome and Christian Rome. So the two became syncretized together in this apostate government run form of pseudo-Christianity. But he also took on the, the, the title for himself, Vicar of Christ, which in Latin means what? Vicarius Christi is the Latin form, which in English we use, uh, we, we pronounce Vicar of Christ. It means the one who stands in the place of Christ. So the Pope is claiming to be, in essence, a type or a uh, shadow or a picture of the Antichrist, the one who stands in the place of Christ. That's what's being referred to in Revelation chapter 17. So during this first three and a half year period, of this seven year period, 
we call the 70th week of Daniel from Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, Antichrist uses this goddess-based worship system, which now has been syncretized from 325 AD onward into a form of Christianity, a apostate form of Christianity. And we know that not everybody who claims to be saved will be saved. We know that from Revelation chapter 21, the great white throne judgment, people who thought they were saved weren't. Dave Hunt makes reference to the Roman church system and apostate Christianity as a system that sells people tickets to heaven that wind them up in hell. And so what we find out then is that during that first three and a half years, that false goddess worship apostate form of Christianity you, is used by Antichrist to rise to power. And then at the halfway point, what we see, we remember we talked about the ten horns, we talked about those might be ten kingdoms or governmental systems. We know from Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7 and 8, and the book of Revelation that Antichrist will be opposed by three of those ten world powers. Three kings or kingdoms will rebel against the Antichrist and eventually he gets assassinated at the halfway point of the tribulation period. Three and a half years into that seven years, he's assassinated. Uh, think of it similar to the assassination of John F. Kennedy on November 22nd, 1963. Young, handsome, up-and-coming ruler gets murdered, shot in the head, and dies. But unlike John F. Kennedy and the assassination of Dallas in 1963, this individual, the Antichrist, comes back from the dead. The Bible says that he goes down into the bottomless pit and his spirit is now indwelt by Satan himself and he is resurrected, which is act actually counterfeiting or imitating the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is why some people have taught, some Bible scholars have suggested that the nation of Israel will for a time think he's the real Messiah because he came back from the dead and the Messiah can't die. Jesus couldn't be the Messiah because he died and most of the people um, uh, you know, that were alive at the time didn't see him. Only a small group saw him again after he was alive. So Antichrist comes back from the dead, this time indwelt by Satan himself. And now Satan decides at the manipulation of God from behind the scenes that he doesn't need a goddess-based worship system. He only created that goddess-based worship system in the Garden of Eden because he wanted to have a counterpoint, somebody to have his own man who happened to be a woman to counter fit and to compete against God's man, Adam, and the male-dominated head of the family. The man, male is the head of the family, and the woman was created to be a help meet for him or appropriate for him. So Satan decided to promote her to not only head of the family, but a God in their own right, equal to God himself. And so from that point in the Garden of Eden, and we'll take a look at those verses, Onward, we find out that there was always a goddess-based worship system competing against the God of the Bible. And so now, halfway through that seven-year period of time, Satan no longer needs a counterfeit goddess-based worship system to steal worship away from him. Satan was always the goddess that was called Semiramis uh, back in ancient Babylon, called Ashtaroth in ancient Israel, called the Virgin Mary in the Roman church system today and going by various different titles. Europa, uh, the pagans of Europe referred to her as the goddess of heaven that gives life. The queen of heaven was always attached to that goddess that was worshiped. But during this second half or this last three and a half years of this seven year period of time, the 70th week of Daniel, now Satan is indwelling the body of the Antichrist, a Nephilim Superman, and he doesn't need a goddess-based worship system anymore, and he doesn't want it because he wants worship for himself. So instead of Satan being dressed in drag in the form of the Queen of Heaven and operating through various human females or mythology about human females that became God, he can now be the God of this world that he always has been spiritually, now he can do it physically in the physical person of the Antichrist. Now, three and a half years into that 70th week, he rises or raises the Antichrist from the dead. And when Antichrist rises from the dead, his enemies say, who can make war against this guy if he can't die? And the whole world now bows down. Those three kings that oppose him are cut off and destroyed by the Antichrist. And Antichrist now, indwelt by Satan, goes into the temple of God. We find out 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 enters into the temple of God so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he, the Antichrist, is God. Now, goddesses 
and other gods are verboten. Only he, the Antichrist person indwelt by Satan, can be worshipped. He alone is the God of this world. And it's during this uh, last three and a half years period of time, triggered by what? The abomination of desolation that we read about. The, uh, that occurred originally when Antiochus Epiphanes went into the temple and did what? Slaughtered a pig on the altar. And that's how Hanukkah came about when God supernaturally caused one day's worth of oil to go eight days so they could cleanse the temple. That was a foreshadowing of this entity, the Antichrist, a real person coming in to the rebuilt temple of God, sitting on the mercy seat and declaring himself to be God, which we learn about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This causes God in heaven to say, that's enough. And now, click, he clicks the stopwatch and begins a 1260-day countdown. So Antichrist now gets only 1260 days from that abomination of desolation. That is to say three and a half years. That is to say the second half of the 70th week of Daniel to do his nefarious rule and to introduce the Mark of the Beast system, which if you take it means you're probably that your genetic makeup has changed so that you're no longer an Adamic human being, but now you're a Nephilim Superman, which is what we see Nimrod doing to himself in Genesis chapter 10 and Genesis chapter 11, and therefore you're not eligible for salvation. But if you don't take it, he cuts off your head and you can't buy or sell, so you starve to death or you get decapitated or you die a horrible death. And so those are the choices that the people left behind after the rapture are faced with during this last three and a half year period of time on the earth. So now, during this last three and a half year period of time, which eventually ends in Revelation chapter 18, when after no longer needing the false goddess-based worship system based in the city of Rome in present day Italy, we now see that Antichrist destroys that goddess-based worship system at the behest of God. God manipulates him to do his will. We, we saw that last week, Revelation 17. Now we see that he transfers his power base from a goddess-based religious form of apostate Christianity that all the other religions of the world came and became part of, and he decides to get rid of all the counterfeit gods that he had used to detract and distract man from worshiping the real God of the Bible. And now he alone, in the person of the Antichrist, is the only God in play. And so he moves his power base from the destroyed city of Rome. Is it destroyed by nuclear con conflagration or by God sending down the fiery judgments that we read about in the seven seal judgments, the seven trumpet judgments, and the seven uh, bowl judgments, of which this is the conclusion, we don't know for sure, but we know the city of Rome, the seat of this goddess space worship system, is utterly destroyed. He now moves his power from the city of Rome, probably to the rebuilt city of Babylon in current day modern Iraq near the Euphrates rivers. That's Joe Chambers' position at Paul Creek's ministry. That's Chuck Missler's position. That's uh, also uh, J. Vernon McGee's uh, position. These are guys that are really well, well versed in Bible prophecy and many others, as well as uh, John Walvert. And again, as we've already mentioned, Alexander Hislop. This power base is now moved eastward to Babylon, the actual city of Babylon. And there he sets up a political economic system that rules over the whole world for this last three and a half years. There are no other religious uh, counterfeits allowed because he alone is the only religion. You worship me, take my mark, or you die. And that goes on until Jesus returns, which we'll look at next week in Revelation 19, at the final battle of the Armageddon Wars, which concludes with the Battle of Armageddon, where in Babylon, the city, the governmental headquarters of the Antichrist is utterly destroyed. And so let's take a look at the verses and see if we have support for that. And we're going to go into the Old Testament and we're going to look at in your homework. I don't usually give homework to you guys, but you guys are going to have a homework assignment after you listen to this or while you're listening to this or prior to listening to this. You can stop and take a look if you would. Revelation chapter 18. Take a look at Zechariah chapter 5, verse 5, and then go to the prophet Jeremiah and take a look at Revelation, uh, excuse me, Jeremiah chapter 44. There's 29 verses in there, but there's a lot of information in those 29 verses that talk about who this entity, the Queen of Heaven, is and how feminism didn't begin in the 1970s in the United States of America with Gloria Steinem. Uh, it began actually 
prior to the creation of the United States of America, and it was already in practice in ancient Israel. And here's, you know, I mean, goodness forbid, you read the Bible over and over again, and it shocks me how, after so many years of reading it, I can still learn new things. As I was preparing for today's teaching, I took a look at Jeremiah chapter 44 and just read it verse by verse, and I saw, wait a minute, hold on a second. Is God saying that feminism existed in ancient Israel? Now think about it, in the New Testament, we know that Paul says that a woman has to remain silent in the church and she can't take a leadership position over a man in the church. That's a pretty conservative uh, position. In today's modern world of women's rights and the Supreme Court, you know, passed the Roe v. Wade decision where, which resulted in 75 million American babies being aborted since 1973, based upon the idea that a woman and a woman alone has a fundamental right to kill her child, even if the father doesn't agree to it. That's a, a, a determination in the legal system of the world's most powerful nation that's based in feminism and women's rights and the power of the woman to make a decision over the life of children regardless of what any man might think. And we see that that didn't actually start in 1973 with the Supreme Court's Roe v. Wade decision. It was already in practice in ancient Israel. So again, in the Bible, there are conservative rules about uh, what women were allowed to do in terms of the church and leadership and those things. But in ancient Israel, it was way more conservative. Remember, in the temple, the Holy of Holies was in the very center. And then in the inner court, the priest and the males who were Jewish and circumcised were allowed to enter into the inner court. Then there was an outer court of the Gentiles where the pagan unbelievers were allowed to come and learn about the God of Israel. But guess who else had to be in that outer court? Women, all women, it didn't matter whether you were a Gentile woman and a pagan or a practitioner of witchcraft or whether you were a Jewish woman married to a circumcised male, you couldn't go into the inner court. Because of what? God doesn't like women? No, almost certainly because of what we're gonna look at at Genesis chapter three, when the first woman, Eve, became the first goddess, became the first witch, became the first Wiccan, the first partaker of occultic knowledge to become a deity. And because of that, it seems that God has made certain rules that related all the way through to the foundation of the nation of Israel, and women have to be in the outer court. But even in that time, when there was an outer court system for women and an inner court system for the males, we find out that feminism had taken over the nation of Israel, taken over Judah, which had divided from Israel at this point. And so God sent the prophet Jeremiah along to condemn the rise of what clearly is a form of feminism, where the men were submitting to the authority of the Jewish women and allowing them to do what? Burn incense and bake cakes to the female goddess entity that began, I would submit to you, we're gonna look at in Genesis chapter three and took form in the, in the person of Semiramis in ancient Babylon in the Tower of Babel. And that's where she took on the title, the queen of heaven. Israel eventually was worshiping this same goddess entity under the name of Ashtaroth. And they were burning incense, baking cakes and doing other things, which eventually led to, as it always does, human blood sacrifice. And the reason why, the prosperity gospel that we see Benny Hinn and TBN and Kenneth Copeland and all these guys from the 1970s onward preaching here in, in the United States of America actually existed in a pre-Christian era in ancient Israel. And that's why, because Semiramis, who was then called Ashtaroth, made the crops grow, brought prosperity to the Jewish families who were under the law of Moses and the men submitted because, well, hey, if your goddess that you're worshiping and baking cakes and burning incense to can make the crops grow, then shoot, we're gonna go along with it for the prosperity because we don't want the family to suffer. And so we see that even in ancient Israel, when God sent Jeremiah the prophet to say, stop worshiping the queen of heaven, this is an abomination, and God's really mad about it, it was the women, not the Jewish men, but the women that told Jeremiah, you go tell God that this is our answer. Our answer is the queen of heaven makes the crops grow. The queen of heaven brings prosperity to us. And do you think our husbands don't know about this? They're in it right along with us. They allow us to go and burn incense and bake cakes to her because they're getting the prosperity too. So don't just blame us. 
the men are in on it too. And as it turned out, that's exactly right. The men had abandoned their leadership model that God had given to Adam in the Garden of Eden, gave into the nation of Israel after the nation of Israel was created and the temple system was created. They abandoned their leadership role to their wives and their wives followed in the footsteps of their mother Eve in worshiping a goddess of the sky who could do great things like make the crops grow, bring prosperity to their family, and the husband said nothing because they benefited from it economically as well. Which was shocking because I never, I never read that before. I was like, feminism in ancient Israel? No, that's impossible. But it was, and that's why God eventually got so angry at the women's response on behalf of the men that he sent them into the Babylonian captivity for 70 years, which we read about Daniel chapter 9. So I'm going fast because we got a lot of ground to cover. So let's go ahead and take a look at our text today, Revelation chapter 18. And let's see if we can take a look at the first few verses there. And let me go ahead and read it, and you guys can follow along at home. Revelation 18, it says, And after these things, what? After the destruction of religious, goddess-based worship system, Mystery Babylon in Revelation 17, John now is being shown, And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was uh, lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. So it's super emphasized by God when he says it twice. Um, and it's become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage for every unclean and hateful bird. In Judaism, certain types of animals were unclean ritualistically. A stork, by the way, is one of the unclean birds. And we're gonna look at why that's important because the Holy Spirit is teaching us something in uh, the Zechariah chapter 5, verse 5 passage, where a stork, an unclean bird, is used to create the Mystery Babylon system. And so it says, For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Again, which type of Christianity on the, form of, uh, on the face of the earth today practices with burning of incense? Uh, Southern Baptist? No. Uh, regular Baptist? No. Uh, Methodist? No. Um, Pentecostals? No. It's the Roman church system and her harlot children, the Episcopalian church in the United States of America and the Anglican church in England. Um, all imitate their mother, the mother of these apostate forms of religion, of Christian religion, by the way, burning incense and doing things like baking cakes. And it's been argued by Dave Hunt, Alexander Hislop, that the modern Catholic wafer that they take during the communion service while they're burning incense is a type of the cakes that were baked to the Queen of Heaven in Jeremiah chapter 44, which brought down the wrath of God on Israel. But let's go on. It says, Verse 7, and it says, And another voice from heaven came, saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partaker of her sins, that you may not receive her plagues. For her sins have reached the heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Well, wait a minute. So, if this is true, and this is literally to be taken true, then the Roman system, which became the Roman Catholic Church, has to be this mystery Babylon system because remember the killing of believers in Jesus Christ who eventually became called Christian began when the Romans crucified Jesus. He came back from the dead and all these people became, became followers of him. And then those people were put to death. Originally it was by uh, people from the Jewish temple who like Paul and like the Sanhedrin that opposed this aberrant form of Judaism that was referred to eventually as Christianity. But eventually Rome saw this as a threat because it talked about there being another king, Jesus, who was once alive and that the Romans had killed who Paul was asserting to be alive again. So eventually Rome saw this as the greatest threat to their worldwide empire. Higher. And so they eventually began killing Christians en masse, eventually throwing them to the lions in the Colosseum. And we've seen books and movies and all kinds of things about how men, women, and children were all of different nations who were part of the Roman Empire, uh, willingly went to their violent, horrible deaths, being thrown to the lions in the Roman Colosseum while the Roman pagans cheered on. Why? Because Caesar saw this Christian faith where people were saying that there was another king who couldn't die, who was coming to take over the world as a real threat to his power base because it gave hope to the people. And so 
he began killing the Christians. And then eventually Constantine came to the throne by saying, oh, I saw a vision in the sky and the God of the Bible told me to become the Pontifex Maximus and the Vicar of Christ and I'm not going to kill you Christians anymore. Which is how the hardcore fundamentalist believers in the city of Rome were tricked into believing, well, this must be from God if the guy who was scheduled to kill me tomorrow has changed his mind overnight and now become my defender and protector, that has to be a supernatural miracle of God. But not all supernaturalism is of God. And this supernaturalism was a brilliant military tactical move by Satan, who was the master strategist from a military standpoint, by co-opting this nascent church in Rome and turning it into a new form of the Roman Empire, but a religious one. Not a pagan religious one, but a pseudo-Christianized one that can now spread around the world with the spread, because Satan knew that the blood of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus was gonna cause this new faith-based paradigm that once upon a time was just for Jews, but now includes all the people of the world was a real threat, and he had to counter it with this Roman church system. So we pick up then and find out then that uh, it goes on to say, and so it says, God is saying, reward Babylon even as she rewarded you, and double her unto, double unto her according to her works, and in the cup which she hath filled, fill it double. So in other words, God's wrath is being poured out already on this Babylonian uh, false church system that has now become a governmental system. And so it goes on to say, how much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen. Verse 7 says, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. This is clearly a reference to the legend of the wife of Nimrod who built the Tower of Babel. The wife of the, uh, the, the first world emperor, Nimrod, who became a Nephilim Superman through occultic practices, basically created the mythology, I think under the inspiration of Satan, that after her husband was killed, and we can talk about at a different time why her husband was killed. Some people say it was, she was, I mean, this person Nimrod, the great grandson of Noah, was killed by one of Noah's sons, Shem, because he introduced human blood sacrifice and uh, child molestation, all kinds of horrible practices into the land. We don't need to know that. All we need to know is that Nimrod was defeated by God when the Tower of Babel was destroyed and eventually he died a terrible bloody death. After his death, the people who worshiped Nimrod in Babylon as a god saw that his wife Semiramis had become impregnated. Uh, you know, colloquially, she got pregnant by the pool boy. And because he was revered as such a almost deified, in fact deified entity, the fact that she would have an affair with another man would cause her to be hated by the people. So she created this mythos under the inspiration of Satan that she became impregnated by her dead husband who had died and come back as the sun. Now I got sunglasses on now because down here in Miami Beach is super, super hot and super bright sunlight. So I wear the sunglasses. So it was argued by her that her husband came back as the sun and that he shot a ray of sunlight into her cervix and impregnated her and she gave birth to her son Tammuz, who became a type of the Antichrist, a virgin-born God-man, a type of Christ centuries before Christ. And so that myth was spread along for centuries and eventually people began to worship this woman, Semiramis, who claimed that she gave birth to the immaculate conception of virgin-born God-man who would rule the nations, and therefore she was considered and called for the first time the Queen of Heaven. Eventually, the Queen of Heaven took on different types or pictures or names in different cultures, which shows you that it was Satan who doesn't die. You know, Nimrod died off, eventually Semiramis died off, but the myth continued on, and Semiramis, the Queen of Heaven, became Ashtaroth, the Queen of Heaven, Astarte, the Queen of Heaven, Isis to the Egyptians, the Queen of Heaven. And in modern day times, <laughs> the Virgin Mary, the Queen of Heaven, the only Christian organization that refers to so the so-called Virgin Mary as the Queen of Heaven is the Roman church system, which again ties Revelation 17 into that apostate form of Christianity. I sit a queen and am no widow. And that was the whole point. Samirma said, I'm not a widow because my husband isn't dead anymore. He was resurrected and reincarnated as the sun. So he's alive, but he's now the sun and lives up in the sky. And when I die, physically, I'm going to become the queen of heaven and you can continue to worship me in the sky. And that's how the whole mythos of this sky god and sky goddess entity began. But let's take a look, as I said, 
in Revelation, excuse me, Genesis chapter 3, if you take a look at the first six verses, you see in Revelation chapter 3 that it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye should not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said, We may eat of the tree of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God knoweth that in the day ye eat thereof, that your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as God. So he offers her and tells her, if you partake of this hidden knowledge, occultic knowledge is hidden knowledge, you'll become a God. You'll be not only superior to your husband, and he can't tell you what to do anymore, but you'll be equal to God himself, knowing good and evil. And so it says, verse 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and, more importantly, a tree desirable to make one wise. That's where the Wiccans and witches get their title from, from witchcraft and Wicca, means the wise ones. She took up the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband, he did eat. So Adam was seduced into betrayal against God, not because Satan tricked him, but because he was listening to the voice of his wife, who he loved dearly. He loved God, but he loved his wife more. So he decided to go with, God, with his wife as opposed to staying with God. And so Satan, using that paradigm, the woman can get the man to submit to her authority because he loves her so much. Man, that's a, hey, that's a pretty good tactic. So he started that tactic 6,000 years ago in the Garden of Eden, and it was so spectacularly well. It says in verse 16, unto the woman, when God came into the garden later that day, he said unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, and in sorrow shalt thou bring forth children. Women weren't supposed to have pain in childbirth, but because of what the first woman, Eve, did, all of her daughters, the daughters of Eve, suffer this pain and have that minstrel uh you know uh, effect every 30 days as a reminder of their rebellion against god and then it says in sorrow you should bring forth your children and thy desire shall be towards thy husband and he shall rule over thee and so when i first read that as a kid i thought that that meant that god was making her like her husband more uh, your desire or you'll desire him more. no what that really means when you look at the hebrew is that your desire will be to dominate and to rule over your husband but i'm going to make him rule over you so it has been suggested by some that women have inherited, just like all human beings have inherited from Adam, the sin gene, the curse of physical and eternal death from their father Adam, that women have, uh, you know, apparently through, you know, we've got an X and a Y chromosome, uh, maybe on the X chromosome, the desire for rebellion over the authority of God that is manifested in the headship of the male in the human family. So therefore, the rebellion against the man and feminism, the rebellion against mankind, is really a rebellion against God himself that Eve initiated in the Garden of Eden and is played out now in political and sociological terms as, you know, a woman versus a man. It's really womankind versus God himself. And that's what feminism is, and that's where it started in the Garden. And so then we jump forward, if we would, following our narrative to Zechariah chapter 5, verse 5. Interesting. Let's see what it says there. And it says, uh, let's pick it up. Uh, let me jump ahead to, let's go to, let's go first to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 44 follows uh, after Genesis before you get to Zechariah. So let's take a look there. And it says in verse 15, it says, Then all the men which knew that their wives had burned incense unto other gods and the women that stood by a great multitude even all the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt Pathros answered Jeremiah saying so the Jewish women who had been the descendants of those that had been led out of the Egyptian captivity that are now part of the divided kingdom of Israel the Judah the southern portion of the kingdom basically are confronting Jeremiah that was sent to the nation to rebuke them for burning incense, which was a type of worship of the Queen of Heaven. And the women, a multitude of them, all of them married, all of them leaving their homes, their husbands cowering at home, afraid that the wrathful prophet of God was speaking out against them, sent their women to do a man's job. And the women said, listen, 
This is our answer. We will not hearken unto thee, which means they're not going to listen to God. God sent Jeremiah to uh, Judah to rebuke them and tell them to stop worshiping the queen of heaven. The men didn't respond. The men let the women go and give their response, which was tell God, no thanks, we're going to worship our goddess because she takes care of us. And verse 17, it picks up. But we will certainly do whatever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth to burn incense unto the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her, as we have done. We and our fathers, our kings, and our princes in the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem, and, uh, you know, uh, for then had we plenty of victuals and were well and saw no evil. And then they go on to explain or justify their sin by saying, but since we left off burning incense to the queen of heaven and to pour our drink offerings unto her, we have wanted all things and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine. So the women are basically saying, look, worshiping the queen of heaven gives us benefits. When we don't worship her, stuff suffers here. And our husbands know that we benefit and so he's going to let us, they're going to let us continue to worship her. And we don't care what God told you to tell us. If it works, don't fix it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And so the female, you know, worship system, which is really a foreshadowing of the prosperity gospel that we see being promoted on television originally in the 60s and 70s, primarily by male apostate Christians. But now we've gotten in the last 10, 15 years you know, super women evangelists and super women pastors, you know, whether it be uh, Joyce Myers or Beth Moore or whoever, all these women are popping up saying basically the same thing now that the ancient women of ancient Israel said. Verse 22 of Jeremiah chapter 44, and it says, So that the Lord could no longer bear it because of the evil of your doings and because of the abominations which you have committed. Therefore, your land is a desolation and an astonishment and a curse without inhabitants to this day because you have burned incense and sinned against the Lord. So Jeremiah is saying, look, God has judged you in the past and he's going to judge you and leave you barren. And eventually he sent Nebuchadnezzar to destroy the temple and to take these people, that, the ones he didn't kill, he took captive in Babylon because of this and other sins. And verse 24 it says, Moreover, Jeremiah said unto all the people and to all the women, Hear the word of the Lord, all Judah that are in the land. Uh, it says, Thus saith the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, Your wives have both spoken with your mouths and fulfilled with your hands, saying, We will surely perform our vows that we have vowed to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven and to pour out drink offering to her. Ye will surely accomplish your vows and surely perform your vows. So Jeremiah is basically condemning the men. He's saying, hey guys, your wives have just told me that they're going to continue to do what God just told me to tell you not to do. Worship the Queen of Heaven because she makes the crops grow. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. Behold, I will watch over them for evil and not good. And all the men of Judah that are in the land of Egypt shall be consumed by the sword and by famine until the end of them. So God is saying, because the men allowed the women to rise up in feminism, he's going to do just like he did in the Garden of Eden, hold the men responsible, he's going to kill off all their husbands. So all the men are going to die because they abandoned their leadership role to the women, just like in the Garden of Eden when God said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife, Adam, I'm not cursing the entire universe because of her, I'm cursing the entire universe because of you, and your penalty is that every child that you bring into this world, he's the father of the human race, is going to die and you're going to know that it's your fault. He didn't hold Eve responsible for the rebellion in the garden, which I always thought was wrong because like, isn't she the one that gave Adam the fruit to eat? No, because Adam was the captain of the ship. He was responsible when the ship went down and the excuse that, well, the woman that you gave to me to be my first mate, she was uh, driving the Titanic when it ran into that iceberg. But God said, no, 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 I put you in charge. You're responsible. You let her drive. It's your fault. And God, through Jeremiah, is saying the same thing to the men of Israel, that you let your women begin involved in uh, witchcraft and worshiping the Queen of Heaven, which is a form of witchcraft. So 
I'm going to kill all of you guys until you're all gone. And then new Jewish men will have new wives. And maybe when you come back from Babylon, you will learn not to worship the Queen of Heaven. And so burning incense, baking cakes, that's what you see in the modern Roman church system. You got those little wafers, incense burning, purple and scarlet. Now let's pick up with Zechariah before we go back and finish up the book of Revelation. Zechariah chapter 5, verse 5, and it says this. Uh, let's go ahead and jump down actually to verse 7 it says and behold there was lifted up a talent of lead and this an angel is talking to Zechariah said this is a woman that sitteth in the midst of the ephod or a basket and this vision that God is showing Zechariah goes on to say and he said this is wickedness this woman sitting in this basket and he cast her into the midst of the ephod, or the wicker basket, and he cast a weight of lead upon the mouth thereof. The vision goes on, verse 9. It says, Then lifted I my, mine eyes up, and looked, and behold, there came out two women, and the wind was in their wings. Women don't have wings. This is some kind of an apostate, hybrid, Nephilim, angelic entity made up of fallen angel DNA and the wings of a stork and human DNA. There are no male angels referred to, in, uh, excuse me, female angels referred to in scripture. Every angel referred to on behalf of God is a male, just like God is always referred to as the masculine, as a he, as a him, the personal pronouns of a male. You never see a female angel from heaven doing anything, but you see these two women who have wings of a stork. And remember we talked earlier that in Judaism, a stork is an unclean bird. So we know that these women with wings are some type of a demonic hybrid monstrosity that's unclean in the eyes of uh, God. And it says, these women with wings of a stork, they had wings like a stork and they lifted up the ephah or the wicker basket containing this woman from the earth and the heaven. And then said I, Zechariah saying, to the angel that talked with me, whither do these bear the ephah? Where are they taking it? And the angel said, to build it in house in the land of Shinar, and it shall be established and set them upon her own base. The land of Shinar is the county in modern day Iraq where the city of Babylon was located. So what you see here clearly in Zechariah chapter 5 verse 10 is that there's a prediction that there's going to be a transportation by unclean angelic beings who are taking on a goddess or female divinity uh, disguise and they're going to transport this mystery Babylon goddess system from one place to another place and that other place is the city of Babylon. That is one of the reasons why many Bible prophecy scholars have suggested that when Rome, the religious counterfeit Christianity goddess-based worship system is destroyed by God through the Antichrist at the halfway point of the tribulation period, Antichrist, now under the control of Satan, will relocate from the city of Rome in Italy to the ancient city of Babylon, which is now in the nation of Iraq along the, the Euphrates River. That transportation or power transfer will occur literally. So we see, just like other prophecies in the Bible are literally fulfilled, it's been suggested by many that this is a, going to be a literal fulfillment and that's why the power, centroid of power, moves from a goddess based worship system in the city of Rome for the first three and a half years of the 70th week of Daniel to the city of Babylon in Iraq for the final three and a half year period of time when God sends the lion out of the tribe of Judah to destroy it and end the reign of Satan on earth, which we'll pick up now where we left off back in the book of Revelation chapter 18. And it says, verse nine, and the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament her when they shall see the smoke of her burning when Jesus comes back, he's going to destroy Antichrist and his governmental headquarters, which I believe will be the city of Iraq, uh, city of Babylon, rebuilt in the nation of Iraq along the Euphrates River. And standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, the great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour thy judgment has come. That, I don't believe, is referring to some type of religious type of worship, but an actual literal city. J. Vernon McGee says so. Chuck Missler says so. Joe Chambers says so. A number of Bible prophecy scholars have said the same thing. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn for her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. During the reign of Antichrist, remember that in the same way that the Roman mystery Babylon goddess-based system was the wonderkin and controller of the world of all religious belief and faith, 
when it's transferred to Babylon in Iraq, it's going to be the center of the economic system. Remember, it's at the halfway point of the tribulation period that begins the great tribulation period when the mark of the beast that we looked at in Revelation 13 is introduced for the first time, which means you can't buy or sell. That's economics. You can't buy or sell unless you take the mark, which means you are now worshiping not a goddess, but Antichrist himself, who is now indwelt by Satan. And so that worship system and that merchandising system is referred to here in Revelation 18, which is probably a clear indicator that this is now an economic governmental system that has replaced the Roman uh, goddess-based system, now based in the literal city of Babylon, not mystery Babylon, not, not a metaphorical reference to Babylon, because it talks about the plain of Shinar, which is clearly the geographical county in which the city of Babylon was located when the Tower of Babel was built and where the palace of Nebuchadnezzar was built during the 70th week, uh, during the uh, Daniel chapter 9, 70 weeks prophecy being revealed to Daniel by, uh, by Gabriel. And so it says, verse 13, cinnamon and odors, there's the burning of the incense that's now transferred to a governmental system based upon the economy. Frankincense and wine, these are luxuries that to be able to have wealth and to buy things, you have to take the mark and swear allegiance to Antichrist. So now we see God listing all of these, these uh, fine luxuries of the rich people of the earth. If you take the mark of the beast, you can be rich. Even during the judgments of God, during the seven uh, bold judgments, you can still have your wealth because God's going to you know, allow Antichrist to allow them to benefit from these things until you won't. And here's when he won't. And it says, verse 16, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet. And there's that reference again to the precursor artifact, the Roman church system based on scarlet and purple. That's why Dave Hunt believes that Revelation 18 is still referring to the Roman church system um, for reasons we just mentioned. We believe it's the mystery system being transferred to Babylon and Iraq in a governmental system and it says for in one hour so great riches has come to nothing and every shipmaster and all the company of ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off and they cried when they saw the smoke of her burning saying what city is like unto this city that's why it probably can't be religious rome because rome isn't on a port it isn't on a major waterway whereas the city of babylon in Iraq is near the Euphrates River and probably and possibly during the time of its development it might become a super port city. Uh, they you know make the Euphrates River deeper just like the Panama Canal so you can get super ships through. Who knows? But it clearly is not making reference to Rome when it talks about shipmasters being on their ships being able to look and see the city burning. You couldn't do that from the Adriatic Sea or from the Mediterranean Sea, see all the way to the city of Rome. And so um, you kind of think of the World Trade Center, how people stood at Liberty State Park in Jersey City and Staten Island and in Brooklyn watching the World Trade Center fall and smoke after it was hit by the planes on 9-11. And so it goes on to say, um, Rejoice over her, thou in heaven, ye holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. So again, it's the precursor of the system that's in Babylon, Iraq, that was in Rome, that has date, dated all the way back to ancient Babylon. Satan has always killed the followers of God. The prophets of God in the Old Testament didn't end well because eventually most of them got killed. You know, God used their lives to promote his message prior to Christ, and then he allowed them to be killed by Satan, the God of this world. And then you know, Stephen comes along, and Paul comes along, and Peter comes along, and these guys are promoting the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they all died terrible, horrible, violent deaths. And then you got 11 of the 12 apostles of Jesus, all martyred by terrible, bloody deaths. So what we see then is that dying for our faith in the Lord, not because God kills us, but because the enemy of God, Satan, kills us, has been a hallmark of real believers, not prosperity. Prosperity, in a material sense, is not the hallmark or the calling card of a real follower of Jesus Christ. It never has been, and it never will be, which is why you know those guys on television that live in mansions and have Learjets and Rolls Royces and multi-million dollar uh, you know, income are not real followers of the real Jesus Christ, but are part of the mystery Babylon apostate Christianity. Okay, let's finish up real quick. Last couple of verses. Verse 21, it says, And a mighty angel 
took a stone, a great millstone, cast it in the sea, saying, Thus with violence that great city Babylon shall be thrown down, and shall be found no more at all. And the voice of harpers, musicians, pipers, trumpeters shall be heard no more in her at all. And the no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found in the any more. That's really not talking about the Roman religious system. That's really more of what we're going to see in the economic Babylonian system where everybody that gets to work will be headquartered. It'll be like the new New York City. It'll be like London, Tokyo, uh, New York City, and Moscow all combined together in one big super city where all the guys that, you know, of any craft or trade or benefit or entertainment industry will be now headquartered in this new Babylon. And then it says, verse 23, And the light of the candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. Chuck Mister has hinted that he thinks that this is a reference to the pre-tribulation rapture of the church, right? The church becomes the bride of Jesus after the rapture. And no believers will be in this city of Babylon. Why? Because they're already all raptured into heaven. The voice of Jesus can't be heard in the city because now it's under the complete and total control of Satan through his Antichrist. And so he goes on to say, For the merchants were the great men of the earth, and, for, and by their sorceries were all the nations deceived. Sorcery in the Greek is pharmakeia. And, you know, it talks about this city that, you know, you know traded and sold you know, things including the souls of men, you know, scarlet and decked with gold, precious stones and pearls. Um, and so, again, it talks about the city that is drunk with the merchants and that have traded on the bodies, uh, slaves and the souls of men. Wow. So that's clearly talking about a system that causes people to lose the opportunity at eternal life. Take the mark of the beast. And now you can't be forgiven. You can't be born again, can't be saved. And so by your sorceries were all the nations deceived. Sorcery, again, as I said just a couple seconds ago, is the Greek word pharmakeia. That's the word from which we receive the word pharmacy. Pharmacy can be drugs. Drugs and witchcraft have always been part and parcel together and have always been linked together. So pharmakeia can be referring to the highest forms of witchcraft and Satanism always required some type of medical or pharmaceutical trigger to open the third eye so you can see and interact with the spirits of the air, whether it be ayahuasca or marijuana or LSD or what have you. We see here the whole world is bewitched by sorcery in the form of occultism, but probably now that the Mystery Babylon religious system is done away with, drugs or the manipulation of the human biochemistry and genetics through the mark of the beast. Therefore, you can't be saved. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. And again, the Roman church system, which was the precursor and the successor to the Roman Empire system, killed the followers of Jesus. When the Roman system is revived under the Antichrist, killing the followers of Jesus will be done. They won't be able to kill the church anymore because the church will be raptured. But anybody who becomes a tribulation saint now risks losing their heads and the lives of their family for refusing that mark of the beast. So with that, we're done with Revelation chapter 18. Do your homework. Take a look at Zechariah chapter 5, verses 7 through 10. Let's take a look, if you could, at the 29 verses in Jeremiah chapter 44. Shocking that in ancient Israel, feminism was the rule of the day, and that was part of the reason for the Babylonian captivity, which I'd never imagined before, and I don't know how I read those verses before and never saw that before today. Looking at Genesis chapter 3, we said that feminism, witchcraft, Wicca, and the goddess-based worship system really began in the first six verses of Genesis chapter 3. We tie all those things together, Genesis chapter 3 with uh, uh, Zechariah chapter 5, Jeremiah chapter 44, and it gives a brand new way of viewing Revelation chapter 18. And what we see now, do we see in modern day politics and sociality the rise of feminism to new heights, new levels, when the Supreme Court kind of sort of, uh, you know, changed the rule two years ago on Roe v. Wade, even though abortion is still the law of the land, it, it's now modified a bit. We see people rising up and saying, we're going to take, we're going to get rid of the, uh, any president that supports this or any person or politician that supports this, we're going to do away with them. So what we see is a militant form of feminism. This isn't a, 
a, a criticism of females or the female gender, the whole human race is fallen. But the whole human race fell because the headship of the human family, which God reposed in the first man, the original Adam, was transferred to his wife. Not because he was an evil, terrible Satanist, but because he loved his wife. But he loved her too much because he loved her even more than God. And so when Paul comes along in the New Testament, it's heartbreaking. It says that women can't be in leadership. Why? Because it was the woman that was deceived. And being deceived, she was in sin. But then he goes on to say, but the man, he wasn't deceived. He knew what he was doing was wrong, which is why the fall of the entire human race and the curse upon the entire universe is always identified as the curse of Adam's sin. Not Adam and Eve's sin, but Adam's sin. The man was the captain of the Titanic, and when the Titanic went down, boys, we got to take our responsibility for it. So we got to, you know, keep reminding ourselves that we got to put God first in our lives and in our hearts and any other idol that comes along, even if it's a wonderful idol like a, a girlfriend or a wife or your love for something other than God, that can be used by Satan as the tragic door opening that will bring destruction. But we see eventually God at the conclusion of the 70th week will destroy this evil system and next week we'll pick up with the second coming of Christ if the rapture doesn't happen first in Revelation 19 and see what comes after that destruction of Babylon at that final battle of Armageddon that we looked at briefly in Revelation chapter 16 and if you're really ambitious go ahead and take a look at Revelation 19 and we'll be ready to address it when we come back so I've talked too much went too long but there was a lot of information it was important don't take this as a criticism ladies of you guys it's a criticism of all of us we all share in our role of betraying God but men you take the most responsibility we do because we were the captain and it's our fault that the ship went down. Trying to blame the first mate after the crash didn't work with God and it's not going to work later. So let's just agree we're all in it together and do the right thing, which is to come out and tell people about the coming judgments because that's going to motivate people to believe on the gospel of Jesus Christ. We'll go out, take our tracks, got my whole back pocket got my tracks out there so you guys go out and get yours some of you guys uh messaged me on youtube last week about how we can get them chick.com is where i get my tracks and those are excellent awesome and they can be very helpful and they're pretty cost effective and cheap so go out and do that god bless you guys again like subscribe share this video with as many people as you can and make comments because it drives up the algorithm and until next time god bless you guys and keep as i always say looking up for our redemption draweth nigh, and maybe really, really soon.